right on six o'clock, so I'll get started. Hello, everybody. My name's Marie Gertz, and I'm Professor and Head of the Department of Nursing here at the University of Melbourne. And it's my great, great pleasure to welcome you all to um, our 2022 seminar series, which focuses on participatory research approaches to health services research. And I want to begin, as I always do, by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I'm working today, and they're the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay respect to the Wurundjeri elders and their families, along with any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people with us online today. We'll just move to the next slide. Um, and to the next one about our event series. So this year, we're delighted to be welcoming back our alumni and our colleagues from our partner hospitals and the wider community um, to our event series. And we've talk, talked about um, across the year, the concept of public participation in health research. And we've titled it um, around the art and science of effective partnerships. We're going to kick off tonight with a talk by Professor John Olive. And then on the eve of International Nurses Day, we'll be hosting a hybrid event for our annual Marion Barrett Lecture. Um, so this next event on the 11th of May will be uh, um, an in-person and online event. And our guest speaker there will be Professor Leanne Aiken. And then we'll move um, to have another online event, which will be delivered by our colleague, um, Professor Maya Christian Sami, many of you all know her, Maya's um, an honorary appointment with us, and that'll be on the 10th of August, and she'll be talking about influencing cancer policy and practice through co-design. And then finally, on the 28th of September, our very own Associate Professor Bridget Hamilton will be bringing together um, a panel um, talking about participatory research methods in mental health um, and linking with colleagues across the globe. So we've got a lot happening um, across the year and we're so glad that you've joined us tonight. Um, so we'll just move to some housekeeping. Uh, I think we might have gone one slide too far, but um, with the housekeeping, we just do have some, uh, the presentation will go ahead. Um, there will be a, a Twitter feed. Um, the audience can use the chat function, which is on the screen there. Um, and you can access that very easily through the, um, uh, and just tweet away. Um, with the chat, we'll have somebody facilitating in the background. That'll be Professor Denise Harrison. Um, and so you can pose any questions you wish at that time. Now, um, just to introduce our speaker. So um, John Olive, John Olive um, is with us on campus this evening, as it happens, even though he is from UBC. Um, in Canada. So John's a T1 Canada Research Chair at the School of Nursing at the University of British Columbia. And he also has an honorary professorship here in the Department of Nursing at the University of Melbourne. He is founder and lead investigator of the UBC's Men's Mental Health uh, Research Program. His qualitative research focuses on the influence of gendered health behaviours and illness management and its impact on partners, families and overall quality of life. His expertise in a range of quality methods and his findings draw on research, give guidance to clinicians and to other researchers. Uh, they've been um, transitioned to progressively and formally evaluated tailored interventions. In 2022, John will formally join the team here at the University of Melbourne as a professor on a very part-time basis. We're so happy to welcome him here. Um, and uh, over to you, John, to present your uh, webinar tonight. Thanks. Um, thanks so much, Marie. And sorry about the um, my lack of timing in moving the slides forward there. Um, uh, nice adaption to, uh, <laughs> to a bit of a stracato there. I'm so pleased to have the opportunity to, uh, to present tonight and chat a little bit about three things, photo voice, Zoom interviews, and digital storytelling. Um, the photo voice, I, I do have some experience with over the last 20 years. Um, the Zoom interviews are really a byproduct of the COVID situation where we needed to adapt a, a contract that we were working on. And I've really got some rookie insights into the digital storytelling, um, you know, just uh, by virtue of being a co-investigator on some work. 
I bundled them tonight. I'll separately talk about them, but bundle them. And in large part, I'm asking the question about the trifecta, the possibility of these three visual methods being trifecta, because we pitched a grant to do exactly that, to try and seam these kind of these visual methods together. Um, so it's, it's still a question that I'm posing, and I hope that you can help me uh, answer that a little bit tonight. Um, I did my PhD through Deakin University, and I started the process in 1999, and I was an RN, and I had an MED, but I really didn't have a lot of research background. So I spent about 18 months trying to come up with a proposal that I felt could help us all better understand men living with prostate cancer. And I stumbled on the work of Carolyn Wang, um, who was just doing some amazing work with photographs, um, predominantly in the space of women's health. So working with women who are experiencing challenges around socioeconomic status and housing, and it was emancipatory work. So what she would do, she would take photographs or, or the, her participants would take photographs and then she would interview them around the photographs, but then she would bundle the photographs into a collection and lobby uh, policymakers to make changes, um, which was such, a, such an, interesting, an interesting way to do research. So I kind of become a bit enamored with the idea of photographs being in my PhD. And when I started reading about it, I noticed that there was a lot of terms being used interchangeably. So photo elicitation, photo voice, photo novella, reflexive photography, we all seem to be meshing. I do differentiate a couple of things with this. Photo elicitation, I see as a kind of an elixir where the participant produced photographs are used to interview the participants, really to just kind of purge and prime their narratives. Whereas photo voice was very much more what Carolyn was doing and it was about community. It was really about community strengths and challenges. And it was about bringing those photographs together and let, then lobbying um, policymakers. So my rookie voyage in, in photo voice was very much around the photo elicitation piece. Um, I, was got, I got some really wise counsel when I was beginning my PhD. And it was, you know, be careful about taking on too much and the, the degree of difficulty that would be added by photographs. And it was very wise counsel, because back in those days, in the early 2000s, it was disposable cameras, and you would give the disposable cameras to the guys, you would ask them to take photographs about their experiences of living with prostate cancer, then you would get the cameras back from the fellas, you'd take them to the chemist and you'd get them developed and you'd come up with these hard copy photographs. So there was some logistics around it. There were also some concerns that perhaps fellas might not really understand what I wanted them to take photographs of. And of course, with a qualitative tradition, you're kind of trying to be inductive and open. And so I didn't want to be too directive, but there were some concerns that you'd need to be directive to sort of to tell guys what it was you actually wanted. Most of the guys adapted so well, and I just became enamored with this idea of photographs because they, they were able to take photographs and immediately give me some depth of their experience. So one of the things that I noticed immediately was this temporal dimension. So this photograph from TC, who this is a, a cemetery in Heidelberg that he would pass um, on a routine basis, but he passed it the day he was diagnosed. So it was kind of all wrapped up in immortality for sure. But then he also, after his treatment, which was um, prostatectomy, he would go past this cemetery each day. And his narrative was very much about not being ready for this place and living one day at a time. So the temporal dimension was really interesting because it wasn't just around the diagnosis, it was really around the survivorship and working through his recovery. So I, I liked that it could spread across. And, and while I wasn't ready to really think about, you know, grounded theory and the possibility of that within these photographs, it's certainly in, in the later work, I could see that we could do something that was more longitudinal and about change over time. Another thing that we noticed really early on was the guys would talk 
in a layered kind of way. Their narratives were so interesting. So this from Trevor, um, I interviewed him up in the Adelaide Hills in, at his home and he, he sat shoulder to shoulder with me and just put the photographs out and one by one in, instructed me about what they were saying. And it was such an interesting one because this is a picture of a chair in his garden and he talks about his, his absence. So not being able to do the things that he used to do. So fatigue was a big, a big, um, uh, big challenge for him in the aftermath of, of radiotherapy. And then he talked about a book which you can just see on top of the on top of the chair there, and it was about men's health. So it's the the monthly periodical that comes out, and he talked about his advocacy work. So he was showing up in different ways. So again, this layering of the narrative, so this thickness about the narrative that the guys were sharing was, was really, really interesting as, as these stories were just unfolding. The other thing was that it was an ethnographic study I was doing for the PhD. And of course, participant observations are really key to that. And so the guys actually controlled what I saw. And it dawned on me, as time went on, they were showing me more than I ever would have seen in person. So this is from Rod, and this photograph is really talking about incontinence, but it's a recovery narrative. It's one of which the pads got smaller and smaller as he regained continence after a prostatectomy. You know, so two months in, he would regained completely. But he told the story over a series of three or four photographs that were taken by his wife, in the kitchen of his home in Geelong. So it was really just this amazing kind of opportunity to see things that you wouldn't get, I would argue, in a, in a typical you know, uh, ethnographic study. The other thing was I felt like we were able to share the results um, and share the findings in ways that would draw people into an analysis. So I use a lot of the photographs when I teach you know, so undergraduates or, or graduate studies, I'll put forward illness narratives about treatments and, and try and get develop a bit of a conversation. So this one from Guy, who, you know, wanted to chronicle, you know, these, uh, these radiotherapy moments, uh, the six weeks, every day, six weeks of, of radiotherapy for his, prost uh, for his prostate cancer. And when I showed this and, and asked students ar around it, they would typically talk about what they might think about in, in relation to nursing practice, for example. So the idea that maybe, maybe there could have been a little bit more coverage for him, maybe his pants didn't have to be around his ankles. And so in about 80% of the classes I presented to, that was their concern. And I loved that they were seeing other things. It was like being drawn into an analysis, a different kind of analysis, so depending on who's looking at the photograph, those different images say different things, which I thought was just such a neat way. Fast forward 15 years, Joan Batorf and I went back and rewrote a paper to say what we'd done in the last 15 years around photo voice. So that rookie voyage with the, with the prostate cancer was so much fun that we adapted it for a few other areas. Joan did a lot of work, um, led a lot of work in um, tobacco reduction, smoking cessation. And her focus had been on women in pregnancy and postpartum uh, and the reductions around smoking. And the, the interventions have been very, very tailored to women, unfairly because in straight couples where the guy continues to smoke, there's a, a big chance that if the woman is a smoker, then they'll relapse, even if they're able to give up during pregnancy. And of course, the second and third hand smoke issues were always there as well. So we decided that we would focus on the guys, you know, the new dads. So we recruited them through the mums. Um, and it was so interesting. We gave them cameras and we asked them, we said, oh, would you take photographs of your favourite smoking places? And it was Interesting because again, we were still using you know the, the disposable cameras at this stage. It was the early twos still. And um, we got all these photographs back of cars. And it was so interesting because we wouldn't typically have asked questions about cars, if you think about it in a qualitative interview. And so it turned out that most of the guys were smoking in their cars and they're often two car families. So it wasn't necessarily that the kids were in the car. 
or even the partner. But Vancouver, where most of these guys lived, is a very non-smoking town, certainly tobacco-wise, it, it, it's almost outlawed. So no real smoking outside. And then, of course, the domestic sphere, when the child arrived, that became a bit bound, and so they'd be on balconies to have a smoke, and they couldn't be inside. There, was, there were stipulations, there were changes. And vehicles ended up being the place where they could smoke. So it was such an interesting thing to see. And we just had this plethora of, of vehicles, you know, that were photographed. And so I'm not claiming attribution here, by the way, but policy was developed um, around not being able to smoke in British Columbia if you've got a child 15 years or younger in the car. And it did coincide with the media picking up on our first paper, which talked to this vehicular haven of haze, they called it in the, in the article. And so, again, that notion of getting a little bit closer to Carolyn Wang's goal of influencing policy, we were sort of buoyed by that. It was kind of a, a nice moment in thinking about, you know, the places where smoking was still occurring in a predominantly non-smoking town. Um, we also became kind of really interested in mental health and the utility of the photographs in mental health. So the interiority of depression, suicidality um, came through so richly in work we did um, with a, a variety of different subpopulations. We did um, queer women who'd experienced suicidality, uh, gay and bisexual blokes. We did um, gay and bisexual blokes who were HIV positive. We did straight identifying guys. We did people who had lost a male to suicide. Um, and every time we put cameras, or, or by this stage they were using their phones, not even taking up the option of the digital cameras, taking photographs to share the interiority. So this one from Rod, you know, where he says, well, the path is never ending uh, and I'm exhausted and I'm done. It's a, a, a kind of a dire narrative. And this is the seawall. Um, one of the seawalls in, uh, in Vancouver, a very hard space, very monotonous, winding, but in a kind of a linear kind of direction. It's just such a, an interesting photograph. And there was many of these from outside. But Rod actually contrasted a recovery narrative and, and some sense of resiliency around reducing his workload, changing jobs, and trying to work his way through reducing the pain. So again, some really interesting depth. And then we did a, do a review around photo voice in mental health. And I do think it's one of the areas that's really, really buoyed and does a great job of, of showing things that we don't necessarily see in physical illness. So it does a nice job of that. We honored Carolyn Wang's work eventually. Um, we did get a photo exhibit um, with all of these photographs around suicidality. And what we did is we'd take the photographs and we would add the captions that the participants had matched to their photographs. And then we would show them. We toured it across the country. It was amazing um, because it created the space for people to come in in person and see those photographs and you couldn't help but talk about them. It just opened up a conversation that's so hard to get. So we really love the idea that we could destigmatize something um, as, uh, as taboo as, a, as around suicidality and suicide. And this was the opening, a picture of the opening in the Vancouver Gallery. And we had 400 people there, and that did include um, policymakers. So again, just trying to, trying to sort of share the, the vision and, and what people were experiencing in a way to lobby change and lobby suicide prevention strategies in Canada. But of course, there's pragmatics with all of this and, and photo voice is, uh, has been interesting. You know, we've gone away from the digital cameras, we've moved into a really a digital world. If you think about, you know, the rise and rise of the selfie and that we're taking photographs because we've all got cameras, and, they've, and they've, they're all in our phones. So it kind of has changed it. And along with that, there's been a few challenges. And I'll share a couple with you. Um, one is, is that we have such a hard time guaranteeing anonymity and the use of the photographs. So we did get through ethics in which 
we were able to use people's faces if they wanted to be identified, if they're okay with being identified, and even third person. So there would be a third person consent form that we could do. And so this photograph is from a mum who lost her son to suicide. And the participant was her daughter who took the photograph. And this was shown at an, at an exhibit. I think it was this one we did have in the exhibit in Vancouver, but it got picked up in Ottawa at the exhibit there by a filmmaker. And the filmmaker took a picture of this picture and then posted the picture. And the filmmaker was wanting to make a film about mental illness and was lobbying financial support and backers with the use of this photograph. Really, really awkward conversations ensued in which we were able to convince her to not use the photograph and that, that she could, you know, look at other ways because we had to represent this photograph in ways that had been agreed to by the participant and then the third party. So that idea of even these days a right click can save you a photograph online. And even if we prohibit that, which we can with code, you can still screen save. So it's, it's gotten a lot harder in terms of how we treat images and what we say about them. This one in terms of representation is, a, is another, another pragmatic with photo voice. So young fellow here who, who um, is deceased, suicide, um, pictures taken um, by the, submitted by the sister where she talks about his drug use uh, as a contributing factor. And the mum was also involved in the study, took part in the study, and she didn't know about this, this particular practice, these use, this use of, uh, of drugs that, that, the, that the sister did know about or espoused. And so there was a reconciliation, but there, there's a bit of a crisis around representation with some of these things as well. So, you know, it worked out fine. But again, those things that you just don't anticipate um, where people are, uh, having conversations about, you know, how things are remembered. And I think vicarious trauma was the other thing. For all of the good things that happen at the exhibits, you know, when people look at these photographs and start to engage some of the content, there's obviously um, room for triggers uh, and there's things that we've got to put in place around keeping people safe and having resources there. And this one was a letter that the dad had received or had, had gotten from the son who had suicided. And it was a really touching letter. It was about the love for family and really positioning the suicide as a situation where the, where the guy had, had really been battling depression and so it was ending the pain. So it's sort of bracketing it off. Really, really poignant photograph. But of course, when people engage with photographs of this kind of nature, there's always the, uh, the potential. The interviewers as well, there was four of us, we all got counselling going through. There was something about the depth of these photographs um, where we kind of needed to get a little bit of shade and get a little bit of work through with that as well. So just to say, I don't want to put people off from photo voice. I love, I love the method. I think it's just so great. It does so much. Um, but there are some pragmatics, and I think increasingly in a digital world, there are things that, that crop up. I'm going to park the photo voice there, just talk a little bit about Zooming to your next interview, which is this notion of, of doing Zoom interviews. So we got a contract with Movember um, to do some work about men in intimate partner relationships. And what they were saying to us, Movember said, well, we're really keen to understand men in intimate partner relationships because... When a guy separates from his partner, he's four times more likely to suicide. So we said, okay, um, we'll do a lit review. So we did that. Um, and then they said, look, would you mind interviewing guys who've gone through a relationship breakup? And would you mind interviewing service providers who've um, talked with guys or, or provide services to guys around relationships? And we said, yeah, fine. And so that was January 2020. And um, of course, you know, as is history, the world shut down um, in March and we were struck with this idea of, well, we're gonna, we wanna do this work. How can we do this work? Because we'd anticipating doing interviews in person like we normally do, even though we were interviewing guys in Canada and Australia. 
So at the same time, I was teaching qualitative methods. And one of the things we do in that course is we interview each other, you know, to get some experience. And typically we would have done that in person, but of course everything was virtual and we were doing Zoom interviews that way as well. So we sort of wrote um, a paper um, around that experience. So I think we probably all had more Zoom experience than we ever really thought we needed. Um, but, and this might not be that revelatory, but I'll share it anyway, just to say, I think there's incredibly rich therapeutic value in Zoom when we interviewed these guys about the end of a relationship, a breakup, and also the service providers. We'd have, we've had a 700% increase in the use of tele mental health services. And about half of the cohort of these 80 people that we, that we interviewed um, did have mild, moderate depression um, from the PHQ-9 assessment. So they were very, very good at talking and actually drew a lot of solace from it. And the depth of what they shared was, was really, really surprising. Um, and I think part of that was COVID and being locked down at home as well. But there was something about it that was quite therapeutic. When we say there's no place like home, it was this weird kind of situation where they were hosting us oftentimes, most often in their home, especially the guys talking about breakup. But of course, they didn't have to do any preparation for hosting us in a physical sense, but they were hosting us and they were very familiar with their surroundings, very relaxed with what they were saying and just able to talk. So we actually got a look at a few people's houses. They'd take us around and show us different things unsolicited because we weren't doing participant observations but again just the, a kind of a, a sense of um, uh, bringing us into their environment which was which was super interesting the other thing I think that was so interesting for us that we hadn't thought about um, we ended up being able to collect the data for 57,600 so the total grant was 110 and when we costed it for if we'd been in person even if we'd been able to cluster the interviews, um, it would have come up north of 200,000. Uh, so it's really one of those things where a lot of money got saved by the time that we didn't travel and the travel costs. And we were also able to include people who had particular issues around disability that they might not have wanted the camera on. Um, might have been different different things going on there in terms of disability so we we're able to include them but it's also rural and remote places that we would have really battled to get to and so many of our studies had been in Vancouver with Vancouver based people um, and so this was it really allowed us to open it up so I thought it had great reach and inclusivity that way there was some things that were a bit different I've got to say um, there's sort of trained around the interview and setting it up in a way that it's quiet, you've got privacy, you're able to engage and talk and, 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 a, sense of, and a sense of connection. And we were certainly there in very different ways when we interviewed people. So one of my favourites was uh, I interviewed a, uh, a fellow a service provider and he was in Sydney and he was in his car and he was driving between appointments. And I must have been on a dash cam for him and he was driving and just looking down and talking to me and like, you know, like a distracted driver and, and chatting away. Uh, and then we went under the bridge in the tunnel. We blacked out for about 30 seconds and then he popped back up and then we sort of talked and kept going. So the interview was great. It's just that you're so oftentimes used to having some sense of control of the environment that you're in that this was, this was really just taken away. So I, I prepare for interviews, but I really didn't know where I was gonna be for the interview because you, you kind of transported into their space. So that was really quite different. The choppy purviews, I, I think we all have experienced those. And so, yeah, we did connect like ethernet and make it a little bit better our end. But again, we could, could not control what was happening on the other end with our participants, what sort of setups they had at home and the like. So those choppy purviews were really hard and, and there was a lot of stracato that went on, you know, um, with the dialogue up and back. So, you know, a few things there that made it quite challenging. And I'd say like that preparing and the pacing and adjusting to that self-strain took us quite some time. 
Enormous amount of crosstalk, as we all know, that goes on with Zoom can be really quite challenging. And so trying to work through that, but also just that pacing, just giving yourself an extra two, three seconds for the answer to fully come out and then not getting caught in that little lag that's between the look of someone and, and the facial expressions and what they're saying. So just that, that tiny bit of lag. And the self stream was, was a little bit off putting. We kept it on um, to get a sense of being there, so to speak in the interview. But again, you know, these are concessions that we would make with, with Zoom interviews. All that to say, I think Zoom interviews are here to stay. I don't think, I really hope they never take over from in-person. You know, I, I love that sense of being there, the idea of connecting um, and even eye contact, you know, being really important, very hard to muster that in Zoom. But I do think, you know, when we're thinking about qualitative studies, there is an angle of vision that would allow us to do more in terms of interviews and perhaps triangulation that we might want to thoughtfully consider in our design. It does allow us to scale. So we did 80 interviews in six months and we were writing to the data within, uh, within 12 months of starting that project. Um, and, and that's quick for us, that's really quick. And I think that's in large part that the data collection was, was moving so quickly, so just to say. My third one that I want to just talk about briefly um, is digital storytelling. So I was invited to be a co-investigator on a, a digital storytelling um, grant. It's a feasible, it was a feasibility grant and it really, um, it was about um, endometriosis. So women's experiences of endometriosis. So really super interesting area, not my specialty by any means, but I was so interested in how the digital storytelling works. Um, there's a few things with it. Um, you know, I think uh, we were interested in, in the emotional impact of the work of the workshop. So what happens is there's a story center is a, is a group who presents workshops to participants. So you re we recruited six um, participants, five women and one non-binary storyteller between the ages of 19 and 39 who'd experienced endometriosis from four to 22 years. And they were all involved in online tutorials about how to build their stories, about 20 hours in total. So there's a few stages to this. One of them, there's seven stages. You own your own insights, you own your own emotions, you find the moment that you want to talk to, you see your story, you hear your story, you assemble your story, and you share your story. Lots and lots of detail that sits underneath that that I won't go into, but just to say that those six participants were brought into the space, we draped two researchers to observe those interactions, albeit on Zoom, and then there were the facilitators from Story Centre who gave tuition about how to, how to build your story. Um, just, to, just to help us understand, I'm going to play a little video, which is the trailer for the six stories that, that the participants put together. But I did want to just share a couple of things about not so much product, but process in terms of what was conveyed or by the participants, because we were really interested about the acceptability of this, the feasibility of this, how do we, how do we muster this and scale this? So I've taken stills from the trailer, so they don't match the, the narratives I put on, on the top here, but just to say, just layered it. So just to say, one of the participants here saying, uh, I felt when reading the script itself, it took me back to that time and I couldn't believe what I went through. And I was also having a rough week, my external world and comments being made about how life isn't life if you don't have kids. And this, of course, made me emotional. So I thought reading and revising my script would be difficult. But instead of feeling of uh, but instead of feeling weak and unworthy, I felt strong and brave thinking of all that I'd overcome. So in terms of process, I, I think we put a lot of pressure on interventions. A lot of times we sort of say, oh, you know, we have to describe the problem and then transition to an intervention. I think it's an intervention. I think there's a process in here where we're, we're tapping resiliency narratives 
and we're tapping the things that that help people push through the challenges and I think it's lovely that it got captured there another another one just from another stool that's that I found so interesting because the participants were together going through the workshops the 20 hours of workshops many of them had never met another person who experienced endometriosis so this was a, a kind of an opportunity to connect in ways that would really help a firm experience um, and, and give some camaraderie. I thought this was a lovely quote. Um, each participant, as well as all the facilitators, shared that they'd had a challenging week. One participant had only left the house really yesterday because of the forest fire. So we had, we had big fires up in the summer, in the June of last year. And so a smoke finally raised, uh, finally eased. One participant had a COVID scare and been in quarantine for a week. Another had a health scare and been in the hospital last night. Another had a horrible time with the smoke and was having health issues. Another was dealing with health, with childcare issues. Um, all participants indicated that they were feeling quite exhausted from the week. And I'm astounded that they were all still showed up for the workshop. Even more astounding was that they all had prepared a story to share. And I think it's just a nice reminder that the, the will of the group can oftentimes drive the outcome and the product in ways that we might not expect. So again, the process is, is so interesting in the digital storytelling. I was quite, quite captured by you know, how, they, how they talked about the, the process of building their stories. Um, I wanna share with you, uh, the um, this is the trailer. So we had a premiere of the six videos from the, from the individual participants. And this was the trailer that was put together to promote that evening, albeit again, online. Um, and I'll just share that one with you. I'm a sister. I am a mother. I'm a friend. Sometimes, 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 sometimes it feels like it lightning. It feels like lightning. Burns like fire. Other times, like I'm drowning, like I'm drowning. And no one can hear me. So, like I'm broken. So, so. But I know I am resilient. I am a fighter. Even when the sky seems dark, somewhere there are stars alight. not my disease. I am not alone. I am not, I am alone. not alone. Um, I should have clarified. So, the, the participants featured in in the in the in the trailer, if that wasn't clear. So, the really powerful, amazing, amazing trailer, and their stories are very, very different. Um, and you can find them uh, at this website. Um, uh, 
um, on the, I'll, I'll give you the website in, in, the, in the chat, but so that they're all laid out there along with the trailer. So it's really a super, super interesting spot. I want to give a shout out to Fuchsia Howard. So she's one of um, just, just been tenured as an associate professor at the School of Nursing at UBC, which is great. This is her first time with visual methods and really she's a mid-career person. Her, so she's done a lot of great participatory action research, but this is her, her first time with visual methods, which I think is so great. And to do feasibility, and she's gained a lot of confidence in the work. And I think that's important. And so I'm actually talking to her, got a meeting with her next week because she's now wanting to do photo voice. So she's going from digital storytelling to photo voice. So again, you know, I think um, there's lots of opportunities to use this method. So I think she's done a really nice job. One of the other things that she, she's done, we've got a paper that's in review, um, like we write about most things that we do. Um, and she's included uh, participants, which I think is great. They did write to the paper. So they, it's not an honorary kind of spot. It's, it's kind of their, they genuinely wrote to the paper and the findings and worked their way through that. So there, there are participants included on this. And there are also medicos on the team. So specialists um, in the area of endometriosis, medicos, and they're on there as well. And they got some ink on the page as well, which was important. And also I think about it in terms of distribution pathways. So that paper will find a home, even though it's in review at the moment, it will find a home somewhere. And it will have distribution channels because each and every person that's on there would be putting it in a different direction to share it. So again, I think the reach of the reach of doing publications in that way can be can be something that we can we can think about, especially in the context of participatory action research. So just a shout out to, to the work that Fish is doing there and allowing us to, to share it with you. Um, so just to close out, just to return to the, to the question, you know, is this a qualitative health trifecta? So I bundled it into a proposal. I wanted to put photo voice together with Zoom interviews and digital storytelling because up until that point, they'd been separate. So I wanted to understand how we could seam them together in a way that would take participants through a journey with the, with the three. Um, so social sciences and health research is, is one of our places that we go to. It's a national funding body and it's the equivalent of your ARC. And so they had a high risk, high reward call. And it was, it was saying, because COVID's caused so many interruptions, we're interested in innovative methods that could help us think about how life could be in the future or how we would weather the COVID storm to continue to get this work done. So I had these ideas brewing and we'd had a little bit of experience with the COVID piece, so I seamed it together. So just not to belabor this, but just briefly to say, we pitched an idea that we would recruit 50 men from across the world, irrespective of geography, and that we would recruit them to take pictures about how they had experienced and how they visioned um, relationships, intimate partner relationships that were equitable and sustainable. And so with those 50 guys who we would recruit, we would then interview them with a photo elicitation um, focus on Zoom. We put the auto transcription on. We would get them to share their screen and talk to their photographs. And we would record those and work through with that. And then we would invite those same 50 guys to come into focus groups on Zoom and around, you know, we're thinking around six per group and get them to poll and to choose 50 photographs from the entire collection that would then feature in a photographic exhibit, again, that would be online. So everything would be digital. There'd be no hard copy of anything. And then we would invite, we, we, we would curate those 50 photographs. We would build the exhibit. We would invite them to a private showing 
of that exhibit. Again, more data collection there to get their perspectives about how that's showing, adjustments they might want to make. And then finally, we would offer them the opportunity to take their photographs from the initial interview, the photo voice piece, and develop it as a digital storytelling uh, exercise. And then we would muster those end products back with the um, uh, back with the, the exhibit of the photographs. Ambitious, right? So trying to trying to see you know who can continue on with those of those 50. But that's part of that's part of the answer to the question, you know, is it a trifecta? Is it something we can seem together? Is it too much of a burden? Where does the therapeutic effect stop? You know, and, and what sort of level of participation would we expect to get? So again, just to say, you know, it was a, it's such a neat call and, and an opportunity to, to do something. And that one, in, they, they awarded us 250,000. So there's room to get the work done. It's just about participation. So again, we're, we're very, very um, excited about the opportunity of doing that work. So I don't have the answer to the question, but we have more research that will help us answer that question about the trifecta. I want to um, a few thank yous, you know, just to just to close out and, and invite questions. That yeah, I do want to thank Marie and the Department of Nursing for bringing me home. It's been a, a, a rough couple of years on everyone, and and it's been so sensational to get back. And even though we're not in person today, it's great to be on the same time zone. Got to say, um, the Canada Research Chair that. Yeah, they um, they give me a couple of years back and has um, been really good. It allows me to spend eighty percent of my time thinking about these sorts of things, and which is pretty privileged and 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 being able to do this sort of work. And of course, people people fund our ideas. The Shirk one I've mentioned, uh, the um, uh, Michael Smith is is a is our provincial funder. CIHR is our NHMRC. Uh, equivalent um, and your own Movember, who's very, very big in, in Canada, have, um, have been such loyal supporters of our work. So it's just um, just a great opportunity to be here. I, and I really, um, really welcome the questions. Thanks, John. That was a fascinating presentation and really creative. I got a message there saying you're bringing the zing back into qualitative research methods, which is nice. There's a couple of questions. The first one's really about um, uh, working with people, I guess, vulnerable populations, which I guess, you know, in the photo voice space, the suicide risk component is there. But what about people who have disabilities of any kind? Have you done any work where the consenting process is difficult? Yeah, so we haven't done, in terms of age and disability, no, we haven't. Uh, we haven't got experience with, with that. Um, uh, the, the consent process is interesting though. I would say, um, especially around disability vulnerabilities, and we're reminded all the time that consent is a process, and so it's not that, when they say yes to something, it doesn't mean that it's yes in the long term. And so we've grappled a little bit with redacting photographs that, that people might feel differently about. So, for example, that, that one where, um, you know, it was the mum and, you know, here's my son, it's now eight years old. And we check in with her on a regular basis about how she's feeling about us continuing to share it. But it's also in a publication that we won't be able to redact. So there are some complexities to it. So we're just very, very honest about, you know, um, the fact we can't guarantee things and when things are out there, we, we can't, we do our best to protect how they're used. But, but yeah, um, we haven't had a ton of experience with, with disability and the consenting, you know, specifically around that, no. Yeah, well, I guess the other thing that I was thinking of, which is a question, is around the cost of doing this kind of work. And while you talk about the Zoom interviews being quite um, easy um, in terms of you don't have to travel and convenient during COVID, um, the digital storytelling and even the photo voice, they're, they're quite costly. I mean, how do, how do you do, especially about the translational products, how do you go about working that up? Yeah, so the cost of the cost of those um, the digital storytelling seminars or, or um, pieces that are offered by Story Center are six hundred dollars. So yeah, there are costs associated. I think most universities bought the Zoom 
um, capacity. Yeah. So that kind of got sort of put in as a as a free a freebie in that way. So that was that was kind of good. But yeah, there are some there are some costs. So the the costing I gave at the fifty seven six is purely labour for collection of data. But yes, you're right. It doesn't it doesn't add on those other parts because you can see this one that's proposed coming in at two fifty k for fifty participants. That's quite that's quite rich, right? Like that's yeah. a, that, that's a that's a different number. Um, we were just, I think, lucky to be able to do eighty interviews and and fifty seven six because we usually cost go to woe on qualitative interviews at a thousand a piece. By the time we've gone done the interview, come back, transcribed, spent some time with the data coding it, and then a bit of analysis. Um, we, that's the way we usually cost. So we felt like we were under that, even mm. you know, without the, the travel, yeah. Yeah, that's, it, it is interesting because I think when you're working up a funding proposal, you have to think about that stuff. And in addition to that, the training required for new players, you mentioned that as well. And you've obviously had a lot of experience, but for people that are just learning it, um, there's there's quite a lot involved. Have you got any recommendations about the sort of training requirements that people need to embark on this? And and were the ethics committee keen to learn about how you are prepping for the the work? Yeah. So I I found ethics really really helpful because they help us distill how we're going to do this work. So the study I just described, I'm I'm a month into the ethics. <laughs> because I'm, I'm having to really understand exactly how it's going to work and, and convey it in that way. And part of that is the training for sure. So I've always been of the opinion that you don't necessarily need an arts background to do visual work, but you need time to absorb what you need to adjust in the process. You can't, I don't think you can be in a hurry with visual methods because people come in at all different levels and you need to think your way through it, especially with photographs, um, uh, just in terms of engaging the data to see what's coming up and some of the, some of the concepts. So, you know, I think um, training people is it, part of what we try to do is have regular meetings to discuss the data. And it might just be one interview where we've all read it and we sit down and we talk about it and there's photos embedded in the transcript and we just start to talk about interpretations and then the process by which the person took those photographs. So the guys would often say to us who took the photograph, what they were thinking about when they took the photograph, all those sorts of process things, which I think just helps us as qualitative researchers to feel more comfortable with, with the data that we're getting. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so in, in terms of that engagement and work up, like the governance there, so we've got another question that's talking about, you know, the process of photo voice and and the the, the amount of um, engagement that you need with the community-based services to engage with the participants. How did you develop those partnerships? What kind of work did you need to do as a work up and how was that governed in the whole process? Because that's kind of tricky as well. Yeah, so um, with policymakers, we didn't bring them in on end product. Oftentimes we'd talk to them about that we were pitching this idea. Would they like to be involved at the front end? You know, were they interested in this issue? Um, and we would have some representation. So we didn't cold call at the end with product. They sort of knew the process was going on. The nature of the beast is that it's usually a couple of years by the time we get a lot of this stuff through. But we just kept that, that conversation going. And they would invite us to do rounds. So the Ministry of Health will often, you know, say, oh, could you present around that, you know, and get a date in the future? And we would present some of the some of the work, often with photographs, and then invite them to the exhibits. And we usually get someone through to there. So we engaged those stakeholders early on with the novelty of the work, the innovation of the work, because they were often issues that they were deeply interested in. And this was just another way of, you know, presenting that data and presenting the issue um, that was quite persuasive in a, lot, in a lot of ways because they could see and they engaged just like 
everybody does when they see the photographs, they kind of start to think, oh, I can see this, I can see that, I can see different parts in it. And sometimes the narrative doesn't quite fit the picture from your view. And so it's kind of, it's just an interesting engagement. It's very, I always think of it as very active in terms of the knowledge translation, rather than yes. passively giving his his quote, here's my interpretation. It's 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 way more dynamic than that. Yeah. 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 The last question before we close, John, is about pixelating um, images. So what what do you think about that? I, I guess in some instances you can do it, but yeah. have you got any comments about how that's done? Yeah. It's, it's really interesting. So sometimes you have no control over the pixelating of images. The, 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 the one I shared with the, with the guys with prostate cancer, they weren't yeah. originally black and white photographs. Qualitative health research made them black and white because they only printed black and white back in the day. So it was right. 2007. So, and then there was kind of this embargo that people didn't publish photographs at all in journals probably 10, 15 years ago. I think we got the first two um, photographs that were ever published in social science and medicine, you know, because they just never published photographs. So the, the adjustments and also where you could see the photographs was really you know, governed in a lot of places. It's opened up. We don't adjust many pixelations now. Um, the cameras in the phones are pretty good. <laughs> you know, so we're getting better, better quality um, film through and we really do try to keep um, the option of sharing the identity of the person if that's what they want within the exercise as well. So sometimes we, we used to pixelate across a face so as you wouldn't be able to tell who it was back in the early days with some of the smoking stuff. And um, we've, we've since been able to sort of convince ethics that it can be emancipatory if the person really wants to be known, that we can, that we can help to sensitise things in that way. That's fantastic. So are there many Australians doing this sort of work, John? Um, you know, um, a, a lot of people are interested in it. Um, Simon Rice is doing some great work out of Massenden Ranges, um, using photo voice, inviting guys who live in that area to talk about some of their mental health challenges. Um, there's been a few over the years that, that have done really, really good work. One of the lovely things about photo voice is you can get a feel for where the data is coming from. So when I look at those photographs, for example, from Simon, I can I can tell they're from Australia. They've got an Australian feel to them, just like with the BC ones. So I'd encourage work, you know, in the space because it it brings a kind of a cultural aspect that we, when you're in it, you take for granted a mm. lot of times. Um, but it has a real flavour to it. Um, so there is some good work coming out of Australia and. And I think more and more there's opportunities to share this work in journals that perhaps we weren't getting 10 years ago. Um, and I think it's become, I think the digital has just become mainstream. Photographs are very much part of our lives. So mm. I, think, I think we can message and take advantage of that in qualitative work. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, John, for what has been an absolutely um, fascinating presentation, really innovative in lots of ways and thought provoking and um, bringing the idea of, of three different digital methods to the fore and integrating those is, is really exciting. So um, we look forward to seeing more of you here in Australia and um, working closely with you. Um, I want to thank everybody who's uh, continued to stay with us online. We're going to obviously be um, in touch with you because this is this event's recorded, so it'll be available to, to everybody in our community. Um, please do stay in touch with us. We are going to be having our next event on the eve of International Nurses Day, and that um, event's going to be on the 11th of May, and that'll be an in-person event. So, um, it's a hybrid event too. People can join remotely if for some reason, um, like COVID and isolation, they might not be able to get there in person. Um, I mentioned the Twitter feed before in a sort of random way. There's our hashtag 2020 nursing UOM. Um, please uh, tweet us and uh, stay in touch. And we look forward to seeing you either in person or online on the 11th of May. Thanks very much, everyone. Good night.